are there any questions in the last lecture? Yes, ma'am. Yes, tell me. Ma'am, in Newton's method, you have um, uh, told that the approximate error is given by mod x k plus 1 minus mod x k. How? Approximate error is given by mod, mod x k plus 1 minus x k. Ma'am, actual error would be uh, uh, if we suppose alpha is root, then actual error would be xk minus mod xk minus alpha. Then how it is approximated by this? So you meant to say that uh, in the algorithm part we are talking about? So yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How we are setting the criteria? Is yes, ma'am. What we have learned for the Newton's method that we can design the iterates in this way, right? Xk plus one. This is equal to Xk minus Fxk divided by F prime of the Xk. Okay, so now let's just try to see I'm just going to use the, you can say the mean value theorem or the Taylor's expansion. So what do we have? We have that f of, suppose x star is the actual root, right? So x star, if this is the actual root, then we know that f of x star will be zero, right? So if I consider f of x star minus f of xn, this is going to be f prime of the cn times x star minus xn. Using the, you can uh, apply the means, uh, mean value theorem, right? Where cn lies between xn and x star. Okay. So what happens if my xn is going to converge to x star, then like, which means that I'm going to take a very large n. So for a very large n, cn can be approximated by a xn itself, right? If my n is very large, so cn will be very close to the xn. So what I can see from here, this is nothing but f prime of the xn times x star minus xn, right? Or I, what I have from here that x star minus xn, this equals minus fxn because this is zero divided by f prime of the xn, right? Which is nothing but the xn plus one. And now note that this is, uh, I'm working with an approximation, okay? Because I have a taken the approximation of the cn by the xn. So this is nothing but xn plus one minus xn. Okay, so this is how you can realize that for a very large n, x star minus xn is going, uh, the good measure for the x star minus xn is nothing but the xn plus one minus xn. Okay, is that answer to your question? Yes ma'am, what ma'am, uh, how we are claiming that cn is approximated xn, uh, I mean, xn x star. Par. So, but that is how we have it. We have proved in the last class, right? That the sequence of the tracing which we have formed here, this is going to converge to the x star, right? This is what we have shown in the. Uh, no, yes, we we have shown, but we have supposed many things. But uh, in practical, there may be that uh, what we choose, it is not satisfying that's, that's hypothesis. But then if your hypothesis are not being satisfied, then you can apply the Newton method, but there's no guarantee of the conversion, right? So you're yes, saying that you're going to design a, uh, say you're using the approximation Newton the Newton method, then you have to have the right, con to have the right sequence, the iterative sequence which you are constructing, uh, you can say that that is your good approximation only when all those hypotheses are 
being fulfilled. If any of those hypotheses are not being fulfilled, then you cannot say that the sequence, uh, what you have generated, is solely converged to the your actual root, right? So we that's why we have stated all the conditions that these conditions uh, are required for the Newton's method to converge. Okay. And similar conditions, we are going to see it for the second method also, which uh, we started with the. I think we already started in the last lecture with the second method, right? So, but there were no kind of see what is the important thing that we have to have a smooth function. We uh, required the second derivative of the f to uh, to exist and continuous, right? And then we required that f x uh, f prime of the x star is not equal to zero. If you try to see the hypothesis of the Newton's method, so this basically ensures that the x star is not a repeated root, right? So we have that f of x star is equal to zero, but f prime of the x star is not equal to zero. So this case we will see it separated uh, separately. That what happens if x star is a, a root with multiplicity multiplicity say two or higher than two, right? So this condition is just ensuring that x star is not a repeated root. Okay, this is uh, you are just going to have x minus x star as a uh, as a one of the factor. You cannot have it x minus x star square as a one of the factor of the f x. Okay, and then secondly, we just uh, the next requirement what we had in the Newton's method uh, for the convergence of the Newton's method is that that x is x naught that is initial guess this has to be sufficiently close to the x star. And uh, I have shown with some of the examples that if you do not choose your x naught correctly, then of course the Newton's method will not converge. Right. So those examples I have already shown in the last lecture. Yes, ma'am. I mean, this would uh, this uh, this would be why give uh, hit and trial method. How we are choosing x naught because there is no method to choose that. So usually, what happens that for choosing the x naught, uh, either you have to roughly try to plot the graph of the f x because that will give you some idea that uh, what x naught should be chosen, right? Secondly, you can start your uh, say you can start applying the bisection method. The initial roots you can generate it for the bisex by the bisection method, and then that you can use as a uh, initial guess for the Newton's method. Okay, so but of course you cannot exactly say that uh, this is how x naught has to be. We have just provided certain range that x naught has to lie in a certain range, right? It has to be close to x star, and then we also had this that x minus x naught has to be less than or equal to some m. M was coming in terms of the the derivatives of that, right? So usually uh, the good way to take the to see what approximation has to be taken, that is just you can roughly try to plot the graph of the fx and try to get some idea that okay where the root is uh, going to lie, and then accordingly you can choose the x naught. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so now uh, we started with the second method. And uh, uh, as I had mentioned, that this is a variant of the Newton's method. That is what we do in this method. That uh, in the Newton's method, we approximate the function by the tangent at one point. Right? Suppose we have a, this is our f x graph of the f x. And if we take a point say x naught, and then correspondingly we have this point x naught f x naught. So if you have to apply the Newton's method, you will be approximating the function by the tangent at this point, and then you, the root of this tangent line is going to give you the approximation of the exact root, which is x star here, right? But in the second method, what do we do? We just choose uh, two initial guess. That is, we start with the say x naught and the x one. OK, so correspondingly, we have the points. So say this is. X1 FX1, so we approximate the uh, FX by. The second line passing through these two points, right? And the root of the second line is going to be the 
approximation of the x star. So this is how the traits are defined in case of the secant matter. So here the x, if we call this is as x2, so we have uh, this point as x2 comma 0. So if you try to find x2, you will get it as x1 minus fx1. So here you are going to have x1 minus x0 divided by fx1 minus fx0, right? And if you try to repeat this process, you will get the, you can compute the x3, x4, and like that. So finally, what is the general formula? The general formula is, xn plus 1 is, xn minus, xn minus fxn into xn minus xn minus 1 divided by fxn minus fxn minus 1. Yeah, xn minus 1. That's right. Okay, so this is how you can generate the sequence of the traits. And uh, if you try to write the algorithm part, of course, you have to do it as we have done it in the case of the bisection and uh, uh, the Newton's method that you start with the initial guess x0 and x1, then you compute uh, the general iterate for any n using this formula and you compute the error and you repeat this process until your error is le less than the given tolerance. Okay, so I'm not writing, uh, uh, repeating the same steps again. So this is a general formula and you can use this to design the second algorithm. So what is important here to understand that, uh, okay, here also we have got a iterative sequence. So the next question is to ask that okay, when the sequence is going to converge, right? Whether the sequence uh, Xn, what we are generating from here, this is going to converge to the exact root of the function F. So this we will be seeing, that is, uh, we'll be doing the convergence analysis. But before that, let's just try to uh, get a relation between the error at the n plus one up step and at the n step. So what do we have is this formula. Okay. So now uh, let me call the error at the n plus one at the step as uh, en plus one, which is x star minus xn plus one. So I'm just going to simplify this. So uh, I already know what is xn plus one. So this is going to be x star minus xn plus fxn, xn minus xn minus one divided by fxn minus fxn minus one. Okay, so I'll just do a little simplification here. So I'm going to take out this factor x star minus x in here. So what I will be left with is one plus fxn divided by x star minus x in. And then we have this factor xn minus xn minus one divided by fxn minus fxn minus one. Okay. So note that uh, x star is a root, right? So for x star, I have that f of x star is equal to zero, right? So I'm just going to subtract here a zero term, which is fx star, okay? So uh, there's a notion called divided differences, which we will be seeing in detail in the uh, next section, but I'm going to use it here. So let me just introduce it. So suppose, let's say I consider this difference, f of v minus f of w divided by v minus w, okay? So this, the notation for this difference is used as f of v w, and this is called the first divided difference. Of f. 
So likewise, uh, there are the higher order divided differences of the F. So I just uh, define. So once we have the understanding of the first uh, divided difference, I'm going to use that. Say F B W. Minus. So let me take another argument. So this is going to be. Say jet. B divided by. J minus W. This is defined as. So I'm using a notation J V W. OK, that is I'm taking the first forward difference with these two arguments, then the first forward difference with these two argument, taking a difference of that and dividing by the difference of W minus J. Sorry, this has to be W minus J. OK, so this is called the second. Divided difference. Of it. OK, so likewise you can divide uh, define the higher order divided differences also, but for now I'm just going to use them. So that's how I just uh, I'm just going to introduce these two only. And uh, we'll see all the details and the properties about these divided differences when we go to the next section, which is interpolation. But uh, uh, just for some simplification, I'm going to use it here. And there's one more property which I require here is that uh, these divided differences, they are re related to the derivatives of the function f. So what I need here, so first let's write down. If I use these definitions, so what I have that x star minus xn, 1 plus. So this term is nothing but. So fxn minus fxn minus 1 divided by xn minus xn minus 1, right? So this is going to give me. fxn xn minus 1, OK? Now what is this term here? So we have f of xn minus f of x star divided by x. Uh, so I will just take the minus sign outside. So what I will get this as? If uh, x star xn. Right, get the minus sign here. OK, and I'll do one more step of the simplification because I'm just going to, uh, I have this term in the denominator, so I can simplify this further. So I will get f of xn, xn minus 1 minus f of xn minus x star divided by f of xn, xn minus 1. OK, so if I want to use uh, this relation, then of course I need to divide here. So what I have f of x and x and minus one minus f of x and x star. So this has to be the difference. What I have to have here is the x star minus x and minus one, right? So I'm going to divide by this factor and I am going to multiply by this factor. Okay, and then I'm going to use the second divided differences. So what I will get upon using that, so I will get x star minus xn, x star minus xn minus 1, and the second divided difference of f with the arguments xn minus 1, xn, and x star. Okay, divided by So I've just taken the minus sign outside because I needed it f of f. Oh, so this, if I take the minus sign out, so I will have this as a first term minus this. So this is nothing but f of x and x star minus f of x and x and minus one divided by x star minus x and minus one. Okay, so that's how I've taken this minus sign outside. Okay, so now we have got this relation. So as I said, these. First divided differences, they are associated with the first derivative of the function. And 
the second divided differences are associated with the second derivative of the function. And how, what is the exact relation? So we have that. So this is going to be f prime x sum giant divided by factorial one, which is nothing but the f prime giant, where what is giant? Giant lies between xn minus one and xn. Okay, and the second divided difference, which is xn minus one, xn x star, this equals f double prime at some different point. So let's let me take it eta n divided by factorial two. Here eta n. So let me take uh, let me use a notation here. So if I denote this uh, notation as xn minus one xn x star, this is as the smallest interval containing xn minus one xn and x star. Then my eta n is going to belong to this interval. Okay. Upper limit for the the is going to be the maximum of all these three points, and the lower limit uh, this interval will be the minimum of three points. Okay. So these relations uh, which I have written here, we will be uh, deriving them in an explicit way in the next section, but for the timing, I'm just going to use them. Okay, so if I use them, uh, then what I have got? So I'm going to use it here. So we may come back to this step. So then what I have is that x star minus xn plus one, this equals minus x star minus xn, x star minus xn minus one, and this term is going to be f double prime of the eta n divided by two. And the term in the denominator is f prime of the giant. Okay, where giant and eta n are as defined here. So let me give it a question number star. So note that I have not explicitly uh, written any requirements that uh, uh, what I'm assuming for f that f is twice differentiable or uh, one times differentiable. So those, so this is just uh, you can take it as a, a rough work. And now I'm going to explicitly state all the requirements which I require for the convergence of the secant method. Okay, so I'm going to state it as a theorem. So let me give it equation number one. I think I have not. Okay, let me give it as a one, and this I'll give it as two. So uh, this theorem is basically uh, about the convergence of the secant matter. So we are going to see that uh, whether the sequence converges and under what condition it is going to converge. So the assumptions here are going to be very similar to the what we have for the Newton's method. So we assume that fx, imx, and f double prime x, they all are continuous. For all x in some small interval, containing x star, and we assume that f of x star is not equal to zero. Okay, that x star is not a repeated rule. Then if the initial guess so here we have two guesses guesses so x naught and x1 they are chosen sufficiently close to 
to X star, then the iterative sequence which is given by one. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, if you can zoom in the slide or you can increase the font size because for me, ma'am, it is like, it is a too small, like I can't see it properly. If you can zoom in or increase the font size. Okay, let me try that. So let me just try making the screen bigger. Is it better now? Yes, ma'am. Now it's better. Uh, wait a minute. All right, so I'll try writing a little bigger. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the uh, in that case, this iterative sequence, this will converge to X star and the order of convergence. Will be so. This is going to be uh, one plus root five divided by two, which is approximately one point six two. Okay. So uh, obviously you can see uh, one immediate thing you can observe here is that the order of the convergence is less than what we have got for the Newton's method. So in the Newton's method it was two, but here it is one point six two. But it is better than the bisection method. OK, so now we are just going to prove it. So what is given to us uh, is that f prime of the x star is not equal to zero and f prime x is a continuous function. This means that there exists an interval i, which is I'm going to denote it by, so I'm just taking a small interval around the point x star, which is x star plus epsilon, x star okay, with some epsilon greater than zero. Okay, you have to excuse me for a moment. Okay. Such that. The death prime of X. This is not equal to zero for all x is in i. Okay. So now, uh, under all these assumptions, this what we have worked out here just makes sense, right? Because I know that uh, the f double prime exists, f prime exists. So I'm going to use this uh, equation two.
So we have that. So x star minus x n plus one is a n plus one, and this is a n, and this is a n minus one. Okay. So this is going to be a n plus one. This equals minus a n minus one times a n times f double prime of the eta n divided by two f prime of the j n, where eta n and j n as uh, they are defined as before. Okay, so from here, what I can do, I can write that mod of en plus one. This is less than equal to mod of en minus one into mod of en. And if I define uh, my m as, so I'm going to get my one factor m, where m is nothing but maximum of absolute value of the f double prime over the interval i divided by two. And minimum of f prime of the x, where x is ranging in r. Okay, so then I can write this relation using this equation too. Okay, or I can do one more step here. So m times e n plus one. This is going to be less than equal to. So I'm just going to multiply one factor here. So I will get one factor of the m with the e n minus one. And one factor of m is there with the e n. Okay. So using this relation, so here n is greater than equal to one. So now what we are, uh, we have to start with this, uh, the initial guesses, right? So we have the. So I'm going to choose the initial guess in the interval i itself. And let's see what happens to the next iterate. So next iterate is going to be x2. So for x2, I'm going to have that mod of the e2. So I'm going to use this equation. So what I can write is the mod of e2 is less than equal to mod of the e0 into mod of the e1 times. Okay, let me just directly use this equation here. Okay. So I can write that here that m times E2 is less than or equal to m times a naught into m times e mod of e1. Okay, where you uh, of course this is an i, so we will have that x minus x star minus x naught will be less than or equal to epsilon, and x star minus x1 will be less than or equal to epsilon because they both are in i. Okay, so the first I am going to claim that each of my these iterates which we are generating that is. Uh, now we have generated x2, and then you will generate the further iterates. They all will lie in the same interval i. Okay. So for that, uh, I'm going to uh, take some. I'm going to just take that now. How will be determining the two initial guesses x0 and x1? So this is going to be very similar assumption that we have in the Newton's method. So I will choose my. Initial guesses x naught and x one such that so I'm going to take that this is also strictly less than uh, this is also less uh, strictly less than one and this is also strictly less than one or in a way if I define the maximum of these two quantities this I'm choosing to be strictly less than one and let me call this quantity as delta. Okay, so if I choose my x naught and x one to satisfy this condition, then what do we have? We have that m times e two. This will be so. The first thing is that this is each term is strictly less than one, so this is going to be strictly less than one. And also we have a relation in terms of the delta also, right? M times mod of e two. This is less than equal to delta square. Now, how do I realize that? Uh, E2 is also going to be in the same interval i. So what size should use here? What I have done in the case of the Newton's method, it, it's following with the very similar arguments. So 
so you can realize that this is less than equal to delta right because delta is strictly less than 1 so delta square is going to be less than equal to delta and which will imply that mod of e2 is less than equal to delta by m and what is delta by m is going to be less than equal to so what is delta by m it is nothing but the maximum of mod e0 and mod e1 right and we know that mod of e0 is also less than equal to epsilon and mod of e1 is also less than equal to epsilon so this is going to be less than equal to epsilon right so thus what we have got is that x2 is also belonging to the same interval i okay and if you apply this uh, argument repeatedly So what we get, we get that the comp the all the xi's they will belong to the interval i. That is, we have that x star minus x n. This is less than equal to epsilon for all n. Okay. So this is the first thing we observed and also what we have the second condition we are going to get that m times e1 this is less than equal to delta all right so uh, this is about uh, uh, like we have got the complete sequence in the interval i now let's talk uh, let, try to show that how uh, this sequence is going to converge that is we have to show that x n converges to x star so for that uh, I'm just going to continue from here that we have that m times e2 is less than equal to delta square, right? This, this is what we got from here. Now, what will happen to the m times e3? So I'm just going to see that what will happen to the general iterate. So for that, I'm just continuing that procedure. So this I'm going to use the same relation. So this if you can call it, I think we called it uh, two. So using the same relation we have that m times of e3 is going to be less than equal to m times of e2 and m times of e1, right? So m times of e2 is less than equal to delta square and m times of e1 is less than equal to delta. So what I get is that this is less than equal to delta q. Okay. So what will happen to m times e4? So this is less than equal to m times e3 into m times e2, which is, so this is less than equal to delta q and this is less than equal to delta square. So we get delta raised to power 5. Okay, so now I want to write the general term. So what will happen if I take m times of the en? So what is the power I'm going to get? Okay, that's what I want to find. So say I, I get some number which is qn here, okay, which I will determine that what this qn is going to be. Now how I'm going to determine this? So I'm just going to observe what will what is the relation between qn and so let's, uh, let's just try to use this relation. So what I have is that this is less than equal to this. Now what I expect that I want to observe the same relation for the an plus one also, right? But what I've got from here is that this will be delta times qn and this will be less than equal to delta times qn minus one. So this is what I get qn plus qn minus 1. So I want this to be the same as delta raised to power qn plus 1. Okay, that is what is uh, the relation I'm getting between the qn's is that qn plus 1 equals q 
qn plus qn minus 1 for n greater than or equal to 1. So let's give it a equation number 3. And what can I say about the, the starting? Uh, so say if I take n is equal to 1, that is what can I say for the q0 and q1? What these two numbers are going to be? One. They are one. Okay. So do you recognize this sequence? Yes, ma'am. Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a Fibonacci sequence of numbers. So And we have the explicit term of the this Fibonacci sequence. So this you can try to find. Is that the QN? That is the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence is. So I'm going to write it explicitly 1 plus root 5 by 2 is to power n plus 1 minus 1 minus root 5 by 2 is to power n plus 1 1 divided by root 5. Okay, in a way if I denote uh, my r naught as 1 plus root 5 divided by 2, then this is going to be r naught raised to power n plus 1. And if I call this vector as r1, then this is r1 raised to power n plus 1. Okay. And this is uh, approximately 1.618. And this is approximately minus 0 0.618. OK, so if I take a very large uh, large value of the n, so what will happen? So here uh, I can ignore this term for the very large value of the n. So Qn is going to be approximately 1 by root 5, 1.618 raised to power n plus 1. OK. But for, uh, OK, let's go back and try to see what we have got. Let's give it a equation number. So this is 4. So we have got the uh, approximate value of the QN. So what, now let's go back to this step. So what we have got is that mod of the en, this is less than equal to delta raised to power qn divided by m for n greater than equal to zero, where this qn is given by four. So you can see it as a relation three and four. Okay. So now can what can you say about the convergence of this sequence? So what will happen to the sequence QN as n tends to infinity? Where, where will it converge the sequence QN? OK, so you can check that the sequence QN is going to converge to infinity okay. as n tends to infinity. So what will happen? Delta is strictly less than 1. So that will imply that this sequence that EN is going to 0. This means that XN is going to X star.
okay so we have got that the sequent xn converges now uh, let's try to see what is the order of the convergence so the explicit formula what we have for the order of the convergence is so we we can prove that limit n tends to infinity mod an plus 1 divided by an r not so basically we are going to prove that this r not what we have written here this is our p okay that is this is the order of the convergence So for the order of convergence, so I'm not going to explicitly show this formula. What I'm interested in to prove that the order of convergence is p. P is nothing but r not here. Okay, to show that. Which is nothing but R naught, which is one plus root i divided by two. Okay, so for that, what again I'm going to use the same relation. So what I want to prove that if I consider this factor, right, this is going to be less than equal to some constant times some constant which is independent of n, right? So so rather than taking this factor i have an upper bound of this factor right i have the upper bound of the an so i'm going to use this to get the estimate for the error okay so let me call this as bn so what i'm going to consider i'm going to consider the bn plus 1 divided by bn raised to power sorry bn raised to power r naught okay and let's try to see what happens to this factor and that will give the idea that what will happen to the the error term so if we simplify we get it uh, so this is delta raised to power q n divided by m so we will get m raised to power at r naught times delta raised to power q n plus one divided by m and delta raised to power q n into r naught okay so if we simplify this is m raised to power r not minus 1 delta raised to power q n plus 1 minus r not into q n so now uh, we already know what q n plus 1 and q n are explicitly so let's just try to simplify this vector so we have q n plus 1 minus r not times q n so this i'm just going to use this formula here so it is 1 divided by root 5 r not raised to power n plus 2 minus r1 raised to power n plus 2 minus r not times so let me keep this 1 by root 5 factor outside r not raised to power n plus 1 minus r1 raised to power n plus 1 okay so We simplify one more step, so this term will cancel out, and what we are left with r1 raised to power n plus 2 minus r0 times this. So I'm going to take out the factor r1 raised to power n plus 1. So we get r0 minus r1. Okay, and we already know what is r0 and r1. So r0 is 1 plus root 5 by 2, and r1 is 1 minus root 5 by 2. So r0 minus r1 is root 5 so this factor here is root 5 so what we get is r1 raised to power n plus 1 okay so we want a lower bound right we want to less want that this is less than equal to 
something. So, so you can observe that this R1 is 1 minus root 5 by 2, right? So you take whatsoever the power of uh, this R1, this vector will always be greater than minus 1. Okay, so I can use that here. So this will imply that this is less than or equal to delta raised to power minus 1 here. Okay, this is because we have this. So this I'm going to call the constant C here because this term is independent of N. All right, so what we have got from here is that Bn plus 1 is less than or equal to C times Bn raised to power R0. Where C is M raised to power R0 minus 1 divided by delta. Okay, so since this Bn was an upper bound on the, the ENs, so we expect the same behavior for the ENs also. So it's not explicitly I'm, I'm proving this reason, but from here you can get the idea that what is the order of the convergence we are going to get the get for the original sequence Xn. Okay, so here the P what we get is R0, which is 1 plus root 5 by 2. So there's a, a little different argument also one can use to observe the order of the convergences R0. So what we expect, we expect that if my P is order of convergence, then En plus 1 should be approximately same as some constant times En raised to power P, right? So we can use this relation to extract what P is going to be. So here I have used this upper bound Bn to convey that uh, 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 the order of convergence which we got is 1 plus root 5 by 2, but we can use this another approach also. So we, if we say that P is the order of the convergence, this is what we expect, right? Now, what do we have from the second method? We have that mod of En plus 1, this behaves like M times En minus 1 into En, right? So this is all I'm doing for the large values of the N, okay? So this means that now this is approximately, so for the large value of the N, we expect that this is approximately C times En raised to power P. Okay, so I can just uh, take this factor this side. So what we have is that this is going to be of this sort. Okay, and here let me take out the C from here to the Right inside, so we have this. Or I can say that my En is going to be M by C raised to power 1 divided by P minus 1 mod En minus 1, 1 divided by P minus 1. Okay, what, what do we expect for the En? So from here, if my P is order of the convergence, I expect that En should be approximately C times En minus 1 raised to power P, right? So I want this vector should be P and this, this, should, this vector which we have got here as a constant, this would be C, right? So these are the conditions which, uh, which we can extract uh, for P and C here. So therefore, what I can get that P has to be equal to 1 divided by P minus 1 and C has to be equal to M divided by C raised to power 1 divided by P minus 1. So this is an equation you can form from here, which is uh, P square minus P minus 1, this is equal to 0. So this will have two roots. So one root is going to be 1, okay. So you can find the roots and it is going to be 1 plus root 5 by 2 and 1 minus root 5 by 2. And P is strictly greater than zero, right? So P is order of the convergence. So we cannot, uh, this quantity is negative. So we ruled out this choice. So what we are left with is P is equal to one plus root five by two. Okay, and if you simplify this relation, 
So what do we get from here? Let's see. C into C raised to power one divided by P minus one. This is equal to M raised to power one divided by P minus one. Okay, but one divided by P minus one is nothing but P here, right? So we have one. Okay, so let's simplify this side also. So what do we get? One plus one divided by P minus one. So which is P divided by P minus one. Okay, so this is P. So this will imply that C is m raised to power p minus 1, which is m raised to power 1 by p. OK, so this is also one way to realize that p is 1 plus root 5 by 2. And what is the constant c which we get here? In the convergence, so this is going to be m raised to power 1 by p, where p is 1 plus root 5 by 2. OK. So this is some uh, the rough idea which I've given you that how you can realize the order of the convergence, but uh, you can the con more concrete ways to observe it from the formula which we have for the AM. Okay, so one uh, as we have uh, we have already ob observed that this order of the convergence what we have got for the secant method this is strictly less than what we observe for the Newton's method. So but where the secant method can uh, really uh, uh, overrun the, the Newton's method is the computational cost of computing the f prime of the x. OK, so in sometimes what happens is that if you compute f prime of the x, is the, it is very expensive and when it, you talk about the implementing in the computer. OK, so you have to compute fx and of course here also you're going to compute fx so that is going to take some time, but computing f prime of the x n is going to take a further time. So basically, you're doing the two step of the computation that at, for one iteration. So let's just uh, write it down that what are the main differences which we see in the second method in comparison to the Newton's method. Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, we have shown that uh, the sequence x n belongs to the interval. Ma'am, what we get from that by showing this? So, see, you're going to see that this term which we have it, uh, f of so where let me just write. OK, so here basically you have to make sure that these all the terms, they are going to be non-zero because you're dividing by the f prime of the giants. Right? And giants is lying between in this uh, between all these uh, x, xn, xn minus 1, xn and x star. Right? So these f prime of the giant, they are going to be non-zero because you're all x size are belonging to the same interval i. OK, so for to make sense of these terms, you Man, have how? Man, I don't get it. Please repeat. Which term you want me to explain? Ma'am, if xn is uh, f dash xn is not equal to zero, then how See, it is going to be f dash epsilon is not equal to zero? The f prime of the xn is not equal to zero, right? For all n, that's what we can observe. Your xn is when your xn is going to lie in the interval i. Yes, ma'am. Now, where your giants are belonging to? Giants are belong. So, giant is belonging to the interval containing. So, you just look back where your giant belongs to. So, giant is lying between xn minus 1 and xn. This means that giant is also going to belong to the same interval, i. And in the i, we know that the f prime of the x is not equal to 0. So, your f prime of the giant is also going to be not equal to 0. Okay, thank you. Got it. OK, so now let's try to compare the Newton's method with the second method. Just few. Uh, 
immediate differences which we have in these two methods. Okay, so if you look back, uh, what we have in the Newton's method is that fx xn plus one is xn minus fxn divided by f prime of the xn. So this is a Newton's method. And in the second method, we have that xn plus one is xn minus fxn. Xn minus Xn minus one divided by f of Xn minus f of Xn minus one. Okay, so in a way, if you try to see, you are basically having in the second method what differs here is that we are basically having some approximation of f prime of the Xn, which is nothing but f of Xn minus f of xn minus 1 divided by xn minus xn minus 1, right? So this is the one clear difference you can observe in the formulas itself. Now, on the front of the similarity, if you try to see the convergence conditions, that under what condition the Newton's method converged and under what conditions uh, the secant method converged, they are very similar, right? You desire that uh, your x naught should be in a neighborhood of the x star, right? So this is what you desire in the Newton's method, and we have a similar condition for the secant method also. So these both the methods requires that your initial guesses should be in a neighborhood of uh, in a very small neighborhood of the x star for the convergence of the iterative sequence. So both conditions are very similar, but there are two major differences here. The first difference is that, so if you are, suppose using the Newton's method, right? At one iteration, how many function evaluations you have to do? You have to evaluate f of xn and you have to evaluate f prime of the xn, right? But if you try to see the Newton's uh, second method, Suppose you have already stored the previous values. You have already stored the fxn minus one, right? So at the n plus one of the tracer, you just have to compute the f of xn, right? So this is one major difference here that Newton methods this requires. Two function evaluations at every iterate. But unlike to this, okay, so we uh, what are the two evaluations which are fxn and f prime of the xn? So, whereas what do we do in the second method? In the second method, only one functional evaluation is required. Which is f of, f of xm. Provided that we are storing the previous values, right? So this is stored from the previous iteration. Okay, which basically tells that 
the Newton methods. is more expensive as compared to the second method for the tracing. Okay, and we can explicitly show that that if uh, the time to compute the f prime of the x is more than 44 percent of the time which is required to compute the f of x, then the second method will converge faster than the Newton's method. OK, so it just depends at how much time F prime of the Xn is required is requiring for the computation. Yes, okay, so one can explicitly get the estimate that when the second method will converge faster and when the Newton's method will converge faster. And the second difference which we see is in the order of the convergence, right? So. Newton's method. Converges faster than second method. OK. So in a nice conditions, so if you set some tolerance, say epsilon, and if you apply the Newton's method, you will reach to that tolerance in the fewer number of the iterations than the second method because the convergence is faster here. All right, and now let's just try to see that uh, how can we get the number of iterations for both the methods. OK, I'm, I'm going to give you some ideas and that these ideas you can use to even find to compare the timings also for both the methods. The statement which we have made it here that when this Newton's method is going to be more uh, computationally expensive than the second method. So. Let me just. Uh, start with the. Initial guess. So assume that. The initial guesses. Are. Quite close to. The exact route. Exist star. So in that case, uh, what is the convergence we get for the Newton's method? So I'm directly going to write it. So we have this, we have obtained this relation that Xn, X star minus Xn, this behaves like constant times X star minus Xn square, right? Your C is nothing but F double prime of the X star divided by two times F prime of the X star modulus of that. So here I'm taking n greater than equal to zero. Right? And what we have got for the second method. So here I'm denoting uh, Xn plus one as a iterate coming from Newton's method. And let me use another notation xn plus one bar. This is a trait from second method. Okay. So what we will get for the second method that this is approximately some constant d times x star minus xn raised to power r naught. Right. So let me use P here. OK, R naught we called it, but let me not write R naught uh, every time. So here I'm just taking R is equal to R naught, which is one plus root five by two. OK, and what is D? D is nothing but. As I already mentioned, but I did not prove. Did not shown it explicitly, it is uh, this factor, right? So if you just try to see this uh, power here, this is nothing but R naught minus one. OK, so what do we have is. It's the same factor what we have in the Newton's method, which we have a different power. So it is going to be C raised to power 
R minus one. Okay. So this is how the error of two methods behaves. So now I'm just going to uh, focus on the Newton's method for the time being. And uh, if we apply this, so here this is going to be, so I'm going to say that uh, Xn minus X, Xn, this is going to behave again like C times mod Xn, X star minus Xn minus one is square. So if we repeat these steps, okay, let me just do one more step and then repeat it. So if I multiply both sides by C, what do we get? We can write this as X star minus Xn whole square, right? And then this term X star minus Xn will be relating to the X star minus Xn minus one. So I will get C mod X star minus Xn minus one. Okay, let me write the direct star. So what I will get if I try to go up to X naught. So what is the power I will expect? So when I will go to the Xn minus one, I will get the power two square. So when I go up to the X naught, I am going to go get the power as two raised to power N. Okay. So which says that X star minus Xn plus one, this is behaving like one by C. Times this factor. OK, now if we try to do the similar process for the iterates which are coming from the second method. So what I have that X star minus Xn plus one. This is. D times X star minus Xn. Raised to power R. So I will go up to the X naught by repeating this process. So I will get the pow different powers of the D in each step. So I will get one plus R and this will go up to R raised to power N minus one times X star minus X naught raised to power R raised to power N. Okay, and I'm going to choose my X star X naught And X naught var both are same. Okay, that is this term I will have it as the same as X star minus X naught raised to power R raised to power N. Is it okay so far? Okay, so what is the series here? This is a geometric series, right? Finite geometric series. So you can find the sum of this geometric series and what you will get here is that this is nothing but. One by one minus R. Yeah, so let's just write it and then. So this is going to be D raised to power. R raised to power N minus one divided by r minus one right and now what is d what is the relation between d and c so d is nothing but c raised to power r minus one right so i will get this as c raised to power this factor okay so therefore what do i have is that x star minus xn plus one This is C raised to power R raised to power N minus one times X star minus X naught raised to power R raised to power N. Okay, so which is the same as, so I'm going to combine C and this factor and one by C. OK, so it's just that I try to write in the same way in the similar expression what we have got for the Newton's method. So what is the difference you see here? Here I'm having R and here I'm having two. All right. So 
now suppose uh, we have been given a tolerance of that is i have to find my iterates x n till the time the error is uh, less than equal to epsilon so i want so let's try to see what happens for the case of the nucleus matter so basically i want to find the value of the m so that the difference of the x star minus x n is going to be less than equal to epsilon okay so which requires that i have the approximation of the x star minus x n plus 1 by this factor so this basically requires that c times x star minus x not raised to power 2 raised to power n 1 by c this has to be less than equal to epsilon and from here if you simplify this will give you n is greater than equal to i'm um, denoting some factor k which is log of okay you can just simplify it so uh, upon simplifying it this is what you will get for the newton's method and if you will repeat the same steps for the second method you can check it out what you will get is that only difference you will see is that instead of the two you will have r here okay and the factor k will remain the same okay so this gives you the idea that how many total number of iterations one one is going to need to reach the given tolerance epsilon okay and this you can use to get the idea about the time so so that where like under what conditions the second method will be better than the newton's method so for example okay so this i'm leaving as an exercise that you take so i'm just going to explain you few steps and you can work it out so if you take m to be the time to evaluate the fx okay and m times s to be the time to evaluate f prime x okay and you denote by ts as the minimum time to obtain the desired accuracy using second method and tn is the minimum time to obtain the desired accuracy using newton's method so you can find the value of the s which we have uh, which is sitting here so i want to compare the time to compute the m of the x in comparison to the fx okay so you can find the value of the s such that the time required to come to reach the desired accuracy using the second method is strictly less than the time required to reach the desired accuracy using newton's method okay and what uh, answer we will get out of once we will simplify the things here is that s will be approximately log 2 divided by log r 
minus one. Sorry, s is greater than this factor, which is approximately zero point four four. Okay, so this basically says that that if you the time which is requiring to evaluate f prime of x, it is more than the forty four percent of the time that is necessary to evaluate f x. Then the second method is converging faster than the Newton's method. Okay, so just uh, try to work it out. You just have to observe. You just have to write down what the T S is going to be, what the T N is going to be. So let me do that also for you, so that you can just simplify it. So what will be T N? So in one iteration, what is going to be the time required? What is S? Sorry. What is S? S is something which I have to compute, knowing the M. Okay, so M. So that is what I'm going to compute. That I want to see that how mu how much time I will be requiring to compute the derivatives in comparison to the M, so that my second method is converging faster than the Newton's method. So I'm just taking M times S to be the time to evaluate f prime of the x. Okay, and then I'm going to find S, so that my T S is strictly less than T N. Okay, so in one iteration, what is the time required? So you have F, to compute the f x, you need m, and then it can it can be seconds, it can be milliseconds, nanoseconds, whatsoever. So I'm not defining the unit here. That what unit I'm uh, taking for the m. Okay, and likewise, so you for one iteration you will require m plus m into m s times for the Newton's method, right? So for one iteration you are going to require m plus M into S because you have to compute the function and the derivatives, right? And how? So what is it? And we already know that uh, I'm reaching to the desired accuracy, say in the n iteration, where n is given by this. Okay. So how many total number of iterations in the n iterations I will be having? Total time is this, right? So this is going to be my T n. Likewise, you will be able to write T S. So I do not require to compute the derivatives in the case of the uh, second method, right? So it will be simply m times n. Okay. So now you know the exact expression of the T S and T N. You already know what is n for the case of the Newton's method and what is n for the case of the second method. So now you can just try to find the S so that T S is strictly less than T N. All right. So just just uh, think about it and try to do it. It just two steps. It's just a calculation now. Okay. So is it okay, or you guys have any doubts here? You want me to explain any step here? OK, 